back everybody part two of the lecture series and it's about what is special about polynomials perspectives from coding theory and differential geometry hmm. thanks helmet so in the first lecture we talked about some problems in combinatorics that have these kind of surprising short proofs using polynomials they especially use two simple facts about polynomials that are called the parameter counting lemma and the vanishing lemma. And I'll remind people as we use them today. Um, and so the, the message was that it's really surprising how much mileage you can get from these two simple lemmas. And we're going to explore that more today. We're going to try to explore where this argument comes from by looking at some results in other fields that have similar related proofs. So uh, we're first going to talk about something in error correcting codes. Uh, this team of lemmas really got its start in the theory of error correcting codes in the 80s and 90s. And um, I'll show what was done there. And that influenced all the stuff from the first lecture. And then um, after that, we're going to talk about some problems and results in differential geometry, which have a very similar flavor and which influenced the combinatorics applications in the last lecture. So one of the points is that this is a pretty versatile thing, that very similar arguments are working in a variety of fields. Another point is that we had this uh, question from the first lecture, why polynomials are, are useful in the questions. And uh, we'll also be able to get some perspective about that. So all of the questions that we'll talk about are not per se questions about polynomials. There's some question that doesn't mention polynomials, and then it's useful as a tool. And each field has some perspective about what is special about polynomials that makes them useful as a tool. And so those will help to inform what's going on. OK. So I'll start with um, error correcting codes. So suppose I have a finite field with q elements, and I have a polynomial over this field whose degree is rather small compared to q. I'll make it q over 1,000 in one variable. And I think of this as the information that I would like to store or transmit or, or whatever. And then this information gets damaged. So uh, the damaged function that, that I receive is a different function, f, fq to fq. Um, and it agrees, so it agrees with p most of the time. So a nice regime to think about is that f of x agrees with p of x at least 51% of the time. So just barely half of the data has managed to be preserved, and almost half of it has been screwed up. And I don't know what's preserved, and I don't know what's screwed up. And the basic problem in error correcting codes is to recover the actual information, p. OK. Now there's a, a quite a, a easy argument that it's possible to recover p in theory, that we have not really lost the information. So I'll call that a, a lemma. For any such function f, there is at most one polynomial p of degree at most q over 1,000, um, so that let's call this star, so that p agrees with f at least 51% of the time. Uh, proof. So suppose there were two. So p1 of x agrees with f 51% of the time. And p2 of x agrees with f 51% of the time. So there must be 2% of the time where both polynomials agree with f. And we see that p1 minus p2 of x vanishes at least 2% of the time. Um, but p1 and p2 are polynomials of degree only q over 1,000. And the same is true of their difference. The degree of p1 minus p2 is at most q over 1,000, which is smaller than this number of points where p1 minus two, p2 vanishes. So by the vanishing lemma, this polynomial must be identically 0, which means that p1 and p2 are the same. OK. Um, so the information isn't really lost. But this lemma doesn't tell us how to find it. We could try all of the polynomials one at a time, and this would take a ridiculously long time. And the, uh, the cool thing is that there is an, a good way to find it. Um, so there's a theorem 
Berlekamp and Welch in the 80s. Um, they gave a polynomial time algorithm to find P. Um, so I want to try to make a picture of the situation. And so to visualize it, I'm going to think about the graph of the function f, which is in fq squared. Um, so what has happened here is we started off with a nice um, polynomial. So this is the graph of p. And then it got screwed up. Um, so so these pink dots are the graph of f. And this is the information that we've been given. We're given this kind of cloud of points. And hidden in that cloud of points, there's some algebraic structure. But there's also some noise. And our goal is to ferret out the algebraic structure. Um, so the crucial idea of this algorithm is to find a polynomial in two variables, q of x, y, so that um, q vanishes on this graph. It's a non-zero polynomial and of lowest possible degree. And the outline of the argument, the outline of, of our algorithm is one, um, we can find q efficiently. And then two, this polynomial will know about the algebraic structure. It will find the hidden algebraic structure in the set of points. So q finds p. <clears throat> OK. Um, so let me first explain why we can find q efficiently. Suppose I would like to know whether there is a degree d polynomial that, that meets these conditions. So I think about all of the degree d polynomials. And I want to understand how they're behaving on the graph on the set g. So I consider the, the map that restricts polynomials to g. And this is a linear map between vector spaces. And I can give them both bases, and I can explicitly write it down without any difficulty. And what I'm trying to figure out is whether it has a non-trivial kernel. And the important fact is that all of the basic things in linear algebra can be done with an efficient algorithm. So there's an efficient algorithm that will check whether this linear map has a non-trivial kernel. And if it does, there's an efficient algorithm that will find some element in that kernel. OK. So, so that finds. Um, now, there's a small twist from what we've been doing before. In, in previous discussion, we've mostly been treating x and y equally. Um, should we treat x and y on the same basis? Um, well, the, what we're looking for is the graph of p, which is described by y equals p of x. This is degree 1 in y, and it's very high degree in x. So the problem is not treating <coughs> x and y equally. And it turns out that the solution shouldn't be treating x and y equally either. So we make a small variation, and we're going to use polynomials that have degree 1 in y and some high degree in x. So actually, what we'll be looking for is q of x, y is q1 of x times y plus q0 of x. Um, this is also a vector space of polynomials, so the whole discussion applies. And we can efficiently find um, q with minimal degree in x or q. OK. So that's uh, how we can find q efficiently. And now I claim that this q will make the actual function kind of jump out. And one way to do that that's the most visual is to locate the zero set of q. And it turns out the zero set of q looks like this. It's um, the graph of p and a vertical line through all of the places where we screwed up. And so once you graph this thing, you can immediately see where we screwed up and where we didn't, and a big chunk of the graph of p. And you can, from this, uh, recover p. Let me state what I just said as a proposition. So 
to is a proposition. The zero set of Q is the graph of P union with a bunch of lines, x equals E. Well, E are all the errors. So capital E is the set of all of the x's where f of x is not the same as p of x. I'm going to prove the whole proposition, but to give a flavor of what's going on, I will prove for you that the graph of p is in z of q. OK, so what do we know? Proof of, proof of 1. Um, so we know that q vanishes, q vanishes on g. In other words, q of x f of x is 0 for every x. But f and p usually agree with each other. And therefore, q of x p of x is often 0. So q of x p of x is 0. Um, 51 percent of the time. Um, okay, but let's expand out what q of x p of x is. It's q1 of x times p of x, which is our y, plus q0 of x. It's a polynomial in x, and its degree is at most um, Ah, OK. And we'd like to study its degree. Yeah. So, uh, so here's an important point. By the parameter counting argument, right, if we let q1 and q0 have degree capital D, then we get 2D plus 2 parameters to play with as the coefficients of our polynomial capital Q. And we're trying to arrange that capital Q vanishes on the graph G. And G has Q um, points. And so uh, if 2D plus 2 is strictly bigger than Q, then we have enough degrees of freedom that there will always be a non-zero polynomial that vanishes on the graph. Okay. Um, then um, there exists a good Q. And so, um, so the parameter counting argument, this is basically the same as the parameter counting argument we did in the first lecture, says that the degree of q0 and q1 should be at most little q over 2. OK. So now the degree of this whole polynomial is at most little q over 2, the degrees of these guys, plus the degree of p. Um, and this degree is smaller than the number of points where this polynomial vanishes. And so by the vanishing lemma, we get that q1 of x times p of x plus q0 of x is identically 0. Uh, yeah, so Enrico says that now we should divide by q1. Um, so once we know this, we, we know q1 and q0, and we can recover p by dividing by, by q1. So, this is, so that's how the algorithm really works, to find p. Um, so it's a factorization. It's, uh, it might be called. Ah, uh-huh. Enrico says that it's also called, or maybe really called, the Burlikamp factorization algorithm. OK, so, th so this equation is wonderful. It allows us to solve for p. And it, this equation also is equivalent to saying that the graph of p is in the 0 set of q. OK, um, so that's how the Burlikamp-Welch algorithm works. It's from the, it's from the 80s. And uh, since then, there's been a big development of error correcting codes. Um, and so this kind of technique is used in, in increasingly elaborate ways to do cool stuff. But this is about the level that I feel comfortable explaining. Um, OK. 
So, so one thing I wanted to point out is that the basic tools that we used were the vanishing lemma for polynomials and the parameter counting argument. This is an example of being able to do something cool by using those two things in a tricky way. Um, also from error correcting codes, there's some perspective about what's special about polynomials. So for an, I mean, the, the problem is to design an error correcting code. And nobody really cares if it uses polynomials or if it doesn't. Um, and um, polynomials, it turns out, do a good job. And so one, one word that I've heard to describe it from the CS literature is that polynomials are resilient. You can take your polynomial and damage it, and it kind of bounces back. And they're a particularly resilient class of functions, which makes them good to use to, uh, for this purpose. OK. Um, so I'm going to segue now and talk about a parallel story in geometry. Um, So, so we're going to try to describe some differential geometry point of view about polynomials. And I begin with complex polynomials, where there's a more classical and, and wonderful description of the geometry. Complex polynomials. Um, so we're going to work over Cn, and Cn to do geometry I'll also think of as r to the 2n with the Euclidean metric so that I can measure lengths and volumes and balls and things like that. Um, so here's one of the fundamental theorems about the geometry of polynomials. It says that polynomials are minimal surfaces, uh, zero sets of polynomials. So I have a P Cn goes to C is a complex polynomial. And I'm going to kind of compare it against a competitor function, which is um, just a smooth function. So f agrees with p outside a ball, let's say outside the unit ball. And f is not holomorphic. It's just a smooth function, just say c infinity. Um, I'll put a little technical assumption that 0 is a regular value of f and p. Don't worry too much if you don't know what that means. It implies, for example, that the, the zero sets of f and p are manifolds. And then the conclusion is that if I look at the 2n minus 2 dimensional volume of z of p in the ball, then it is at most the 2n minus 2 dimensional volume of z of f in the ball. Let me make a picture of the situation. So here's our ball. And the zero set of p I'll draw in red. And then f agrees with p outside of the ball. So its zero set is the same outside of the ball. And inside of the ball, it may be different. And then the theorem says that the pink surface has a smaller volume than the blue surface for any competitor function f that we may choose. Um, another way to put it is that complex polynomials are, do not waste any volume. They are efficient with volume. Um, uh, efficiency is kind of the, the main cool property that complex polynomials and polynomial surfaces have. I got that word from an essay by Arnold called the topological efficiency of algebraic objects, which has a lot of cool examples of how different uh, polynomial and algebraic constructions are the most efficient ways of doing certain things. One of the most striking examples, so there's, here's a more recent theorem about the efficiency of polynomials. Um, it's a theorem of Kronheimer and Rafka from the 90s. So if uh, we have the stuff above, and if n is 2, that means that z of p and z of f are two-dimensional real manifolds. Um, and the conclusion is that the genus of z of p is less than or equal to the genus of z of f. So complex surfaces not only don't waste any area, they also don't waste any handles. 
Uh, and this is quite a deep and, and remarkable thing. All right. So next, I would like to talk about some kind of analogs of this story for real polynomials. And as soon as we try to think of an analog for real polynomials, it sounds like it sounds very bad and suspicious. Um, because there's the Weierstrass approximation theorem that says that an arbitrary function on a compact set can be approximated by real polynomials. The moral of this theorem is that real polynomials are not special at all. Real polynomials can imitate anything. So it's, um, this theorem is certainly false for real polynomials. Any surface is a real polynomial. Um, so it sounds like this is just going to be a complete failure. But there's a shift of perspective which allows us to have real questions and for something interesting to happen. Mm -hmm. The shift of perspective is that we don't look at the polynomials one at a time. We look at the whole space of polynomials, poly d of Rn. And this whole vector space is, in some sense, efficient if you compare it to some competitor vector spaces. So how can we make that precise? Um, so suppose that V is um, a, a subspace of continuous functions from the ball to R. This is a subspace. So then I'm going to define the area of this subspace to be the supremum over all the non-zero functions in it of the volume of z of f in the ball. I'll work for now in the ball. Later, we'll see some other shapes. So I'll put here the ball to remind us. OK. So for example, what is the area of the space of polynomials? Position, the area in the ball of poly d of Rn is approximately d. It's bounded by dimensional constant times d. Here's the proof idea. Um, so by the vanishing lemma, for almost every line, the number of points in the line intersect z of p is at most d. If there are any more points, the whole line would be contained in the surface. And for some natural measures on lines, that would, should have probability 0. Now the area of the surface, the co-dimension 1 volume of the surface, can be recovered from knowing how many intersections there are with every line. This was figured out by Crofton. Um, and it says, so it says that the area of z of p is an integral over all lines of the number of intersections with respect to an appropriate measure on the space of lines that I think he figured out. This appropriate measure is not, is not a difficult thing. It's the only measure that's invariant under all of the rigid motions of space. And um, for our purposes, we only need to integrate over the lines that go through the ball, because we're only interested in the area of z of p in the ball. Um, and the total mass of this measure for lines that go through the ball is finite. And so that's some c of n. And this is always bounded by d. So that's the proof of the theorem. I wanted to point out that this volume estimate is basically the vanishing lemma. It's the geometric consequence of the same kind of thing that we've been talking about. What's that? It's an, yeah, it's an average of the vanishing lemma. The, I don't want to underplay the average. The average is important. This averaging idea and this symmetry idea is, is something wonderful. This upper bound of d is for a particular polynomial, for each particular polynomial. It's for each particular polynomial. What we're upper bounding is the soup over all of the polynomials of the, yeah. OK. So let's compare this to others, other vector spaces. This was done only much more recently. Uh, 
a theorem of Gromov, about 10 years old. It says that if we have some w, a subspace of the continuous functions. And to be fair, we insist that the dimension of w is the same as the dimension of the polynomial vector space. Um, then the area of the polynomials is at most some dimensional constant times the area of w. We'll compare them in the ball. Um, so nobody knows the sharp value of this constant. It's plausible that this constant is even 1, which would be kind of the most dramatic thing. But I would say that the polynomials really are the most efficient vector space. Uh, nobody knows if that's true. But the theorem says that they are within spitting distance of being the most efficient vector space. Uh, and it really involves being clever to be within spitting distance of the most efficient. I made some effort by hand to, to produce w and, and just kind of by hand bound all of the areas. And it took, a, it took me a lot of effort to produce something that competes with polynomials. And it's, it's a little worse than polynomials. Yeah, so Enrico says it would be interesting to know which, which Ws are comparable to the optimal. I would like to know, too. OK. Um, so I'm going to describe how to prove this. And it uses some tool from topology. So suppose that I have. Uh, function rn goes to r. And I'm going to say that it's, I'm going to call it non-degenerate, means that the measure of its zero set is zero. I'll just talk, I'll mostly talk about non-degenerate functions. And then we'll say that f bisects some finite volume set u. Um, that means that the volume of the part of u where f is positive is equal to the volume of the part of u where f is negative. And if f is non-degenerate, those are both half of the volume of u. Um, and then there's a theorem. There's the, I'll put over here, um, the ham sandwich theorem. Says how to find a function, or that there is a function that bisects a lot of sets. Ham sandwich theorem. This was proven by Stone and Tukey in the early 40s. So it says if we have a W, a vector space of continuous functions, and it's non-degenerate, and then we have some sets, u1 up to un. And the key thing is that n should be less than the dimension of w. Then there is a function in w that bisects them all. So this was originally proven for affine linear functions. And then the zero set of f is a plane. So you'll often hear it phrased that if you have um, n finite volume sets in Rn, 3 and R3, then there's a plane that bisects all of them. But Stone and Tukey analyzed the proof, and they realized immediately the proof is much more general. And for free, it gives this. So let me explain how to, how to use this to prove the theorem. And then maybe we'll come back and discuss it a little bit more. So here's the proof of the theorem. So um, we know that the dimension of w is the same as the direct dimension of the space of polynomials is approximately d to the n. And, um, if w were degenerate, it would mean there was some function whose zero set had positive n-dimensional volume. So it would be sort of infinite n minus 1 dimensional volume. So that would be fine. So we can assume it's non-degenerate. 
And then um, the ham sandwich theorem implies that we can take u1 up to un. n is like d to the n. And we can bisect them all. And we take them to be balls, to be disjoint balls of radius 1 over d. And then um, the hem sandwich theorem says there exists a non-zero f and w that bisects them all. Let me make a picture. So inside of the unit ball, we put d to the n balls of radius 1 over d. And then we know that there's some function whose zero set manages to bisect all of these balls. And therefore, the zero set has to be rather big. Um, how big does it need to be? Well, the volume of the zero set of f intersected with one ball, um, the most efficient way to do that is just to take a disk through the center of the ball. And so it has size like d to the minus n minus 1, because it is an n minus 1 dimensional disk of radius 1 over d. And then we have uh, d to the n of these of these disks, but d to the n surfaces as big as disks, and they're all disjoint. So the total is bigger than some constant times d, which means that it is at least comparable to the volume for um, the polynomials. Why is the most efficient way to go from the center? Why cannot you go not from the center? Well, we have to bisect the volume, so we can't do this. This is not a trivial result that it's the most efficient way. Um, I can draw some less efficient pictures to give, give intuition. Yeah. Um, so this requires a little geometric measure theory. And to be honest, it's easier to prove this with a non-sharp constant than to prove that the disk is the best, since the other constants are non-sharp. We might as well. Yes, that's right. So this is just the isoparametric inequality for relative surfaces in a ball. Sorry? If you, there is an isoparametric inequality for when you remove it, if you make a cut like that, and uh, there is a sharp constant for that. Yeah. So one, one knows whatever fraction you'd like to cut the ball, you know, 30%, 70%, one knows exactly the best way of doing this, and there's a formula for it. Uh, so that would, so looking that up would be one way to, to do this. OK. Um, so this is not that difficult a thing, but it wasn't found until pretty recently. And I think that one of Gromov's really cool contributions was to think of this question, to, to look for this. Um, now, this tool that we're using, the ham sandwich theorem, it's, um, it's kind of analogous to the parameter counting that we were using last time. This is a topological version. And to, I'm going to make them look really similar. So I'll state the parameter counting version. I'll write parameter counting in a way that looks almost like that. So if w is a vector space and p1 up to pn are some points and n is less than the dimension of w, um, then there exists 0 not equal to f in w, so that uh, f of pi vanishes for all i. So this is true by linear algebra. The number of parameters we have to play with is more than n, so we'll have linear map will have a non-trivial kernel. And these are very similar to each other. It's just that instead of having this somewhat simpler condition of going exactly through a point, um, that the zero set should bisect some open sets. OK. Um, so I wanted to illustrate what can be done with this. So this is sort of a problem about polynomials. But we can, I can pose for you a differential geometry problem that doesn't have anywhere the word polynomial. And we can solve it using the polynomial method and using these ideas. So I thought I would show that and we'll have the we did the polynomial method in combinatorics in lecture one and the polynomial method in error correcting codes. And now we do the polynomial method in geometry and make the point that these are all uh, quite parallel. OK, 
So it'll take a few minutes to set up the question. Um, so the question is about area expanding embeddings. So if I have a domain in R3 and an embedding omega embedded into R3, this is called two expanding or area expanding. If the area of the image of a surface is at least as big as the area of the surface for all surfaces. So this is an embedding that expands all of the areas of all surfaces in the domain. Uh, let's do an example. So for example, the linear map x, y, z goes to epsilon x, epsilon inverse y, epsilon inverse z expands all areas, although it shrinks lengths in the x direction. Let me make a picture of it. So um, I'm going to think about what this map does to the unit cube. Um, it shrinks one direction. And uh, so it shrinks the x direction, and it expands the other two directions. And it works out that this shaded area is the same as that shaded area. And the top face also has the same area as the top face there. And the right face gets much bigger with area. And then you have to think a little bit if you have some plane at a funny angle or if you have a curved surface. But for those, it's, you can check that the areas also expand when you do this. So that's an example of a linear area expanding map. And there are also nonlinear ones. So for example, I could, after this, bend this thing around um, so that this shaded region was shaped like a C, and then have something sort of like this. I don't know if that's. So this is like a, this thing is like a thin sheet, and you could bend the thin sheet into a C or do in an S or do different things with it. Um, you can do quite a lot of different stuff because you know, at one point it may look kind of like this map, and at another point it may look just like a rotation, and at different points it can be doing different things. Okay. So the basic question in the study of area expanding embeddings is that I'm given two domains, u and v, and I have to decide if it's possible to get u to fit inside of v. Is there an area expanding embedding from u in, into v? Uh, let me show you a particular example of this, which is, which, which is kind of uh, which I think is interesting. Uh, so my domain t, or t for tube, will be a long kind of skinny tube. It's 1 by 1 by l. 1 is less than l. And I'm going to try to stick it into a pancake, which is even skinnier and kind of long and broad. So this is the pancake, or P for short. It has dimensions epsilon by S by S. Epsilon is less than S. And I would like to figure out for which values of L and epsilon and S is it possible to squeeze this tube into this pancake. So this is the geometry problem. It does not appear to be related to polynomials. And we're going to solve it with the polynomial method. Um, OK, so let me show you first a way to embed T and P under some conditions. Uh, so proposition, if L is less than a tenth of epsilon squared times S squared, so some condition, then there is an area expanding embedding, T. So this embedding with a little 2 means an area expanding embedding of T into P. Here's how it goes. Um, the first step is that we do a linear map. T goes by a linear map to, um, so T, remember, was 1 by 1 by L. And I'm going to shrink that first one down to epsilon. And I have to grow the other two. So a linear map, I get a rectangle like that. And now this epsilon matches the thickness of the pancake. 
and I'm going to not do anything with this coordinate. The map on this coordinate will be the identity, and I have to stick this rectangle into the square. So then uh, I claim that if this box is true, then the epsilon inverse by epsilon minus L rectangle embeds in a one expanding way into the square, S by S. So um, this condition, if you move things around a little bit, it says that the area of this rectangle is only one-tenth of the area of the square. And that's enough to get the rectangle into the square, and I'm going to draw how to do it. So here's the S by S square, and then the rectangle is perhaps thinner, is thinner and longer than the square, and so we can put it in there um, with little bends like this. And if you do that carefully, um, so we have, we're not allowed to contract any, anything, so, but we are allowed to stretch things. So when you go around the corner, you just need to stretch a little bit. Is this mapping um, clear? Okay. Okay. So that's one way of doing it. It's a kind of straightforward way of doing it. And the problem is to understand whether we can do better with some more complicated kind of twisty map. Um, and in this situation, it turns out that this is the best we can do. So um, proposition two, um, if there is some embedding from the tube into the pancake, then L is smaller than 100 epsilon squared times S squared. And so that means that our condition was sharp up to a constant factor. OK, here's the proof. I'm going to let V be the set of polynomials. So V is functions on the pancake. And they're going to be polynomials in y and z. y and z are the long directions of the pancake, not the skinny direction, um, with degree at most l to the 1 half. So the dimension of v is uh, approximately l, because I have two variables and degree l to the 1 half. And then the area of v is bounded by uh, L, L to the 1 half times S times epsilon. So let me explain that. So I take a non-zero function in V. And since it doesn't depend on Y and Z, its zero set is just a cylinder. It's some curve in the square here crossed with zero epsilon. And the curve in the square is a degree L to the 1 half curve in a square of scale S. And so the length of the curve is at most like L to the 1 half S. And then the thickness is epsilon. OK. Now suppose that I had this two expanding embedding phi from the tube into the pancake. Um, then. I can look at the pullback of V, which is a set of continuous functions in the tube. And because the area in the, in, in the tube is always smaller than the area in the pancake, I get that the area of the pullback of V is less than or equal to the area of V. OK. But then. I can use the ham sandwich theorem to find a function in the pullback of V that bisects a bunch of sets and is therefore big. So the dimension of the pullback of V is approximately L. I can choose U1 up to UL, or not quite L, uh, in the tube, which are disjoint balls of radius around 1.
And by the ham sandwich theorem, there exists some f in the pullback of v. So that f bisects all of the ui. It bisects l unit balls, and so the area of z of f is at least on the order of l. OK, so if I put together the inequalities that we just did, we saw that L is smaller than, smaller than the area of the pullback of V, which is smaller than the area of V, which is smaller than L to the 1 half times S times epsilon. And now if we manipulate this equation to get the L by itself, and if we work out the constants carefully, we get the proposition. And I want to point out that this is pretty parallel to the argument that we did earlier today about error correcting codes, or the argument that we did uh, yesterday about finite field Nicodemus joints or something. Basically, there were two significant things in this argument. One point is that the area of V is not too big. And this really boiled down to the vanishing lemma, and also the averaging. And the other point is that the area of the pullback of v was pretty big. That was just because its dimension was big, and we had enough parameters to play with. And so at this moment, what we basically used was parameter count. OK. Now, in the context of this proposition, we can revisit the question, um, why should we be using polynomials? Um, so. Suppose I want to prove this proposition, and uh, I don't right away write down that I want to use polynomials. I just think, what am I looking for in a vector space of functions? Well, um, one point is that I'd like the vector space to have dimension L, so that at this moment I can cut the tube up into L balls. So I want a vector space of dimension L. And then um, the other point is I would like this area of the vector space to be as small as possible, because the smaller it is, the better I get. Um, so the vector space I want to use is the vector space of the given dimension L, whose area is as small as possible. I want to use, in other words, the most efficient vector space. And polynomials enter the story because, as Gromov proved, they are the most efficient vector space up to constant factors. OK. Um, so in the last lecture, we're going to return to combinatorics, and there's some, some further applications of the polynomial method in combinatorics. And it, the new ingredient is that it uses this kind of ham sandwich stuff, which had its origin in, in differential geometry problems, like I've shown you. Uh, thank you very much for coming.